Welcome to another episode of Scholars by the Sea, a podcast dedicated to interviewing some of the most interesting scholars and authors helping to shape our understanding of the past. For today's episode, we have with us in our studio as host, Naval Academy history professor Miles Yu, who sits down with one of the world's foremost historians of modern China, Professor Dr. Frank D. Cutter of the University of Hong Kong, whose award-winning trilogy of the history of the People's Republic of China has changed our views on the Chinese Communist Revolution and its profound impact on the world. Thank you, Professor Burgess, for that uh, generous introduction. And uh, today uh, with me is the distinguished professor of modern China, uh, Professor Frank D. Cutter of the University of Hong Kong. Let me uh, just uh, uh, say a little bit about the Professor De Carter. And Chinese modern history is very murky. It's murky not because of a, a lack of evidence, but because of a lack of a correct and truthful interpretation of evidence. On top of that, precisely because of this uh, very skewed uh, intellectual environment that exists in China, even if we have abundant of evidence, uh, we still cannot cross-examine the truthfulness of evidence and uh, Professor DeCarter is uh, one of the few handful, if not the only professor uh, studying that period who actually has done amazing archival research and finding out the truth of what actually happened in the 70 some odd years of the Chinese Communist regime uh, since 1949. So um, he uh, is truly a uh, intellectual giant in our field, and so I'm so glad and uh, honored to be able to sit down with him to talk about uh, uh, issues of common concern. So my first question is, uh, related to what I just said, right? what do you think is the most challenging obstacle in your research uh, of modern history, particularly the history of uh, communist China? That's a really tough question. <laughs> I mean, common sense indicates that the most uh, difficult aspect is, of course, to, to gain access to the archives and to be able to read as wide a range of documents as possible. Um, and, and to me, that really is the foundation of, of any good historical scholarship. Or to put it slightly differently, um, you know that historians make a difference between primary sources and secondary sources. Secondary sources are works that more or less summarize the work of other historians. Uh, we, we have often lost sight of the fact that the primary sources should be primary and the secondary sources should be secondary. So, so too, too much work relies really on the work of others, including people who may never have set a foot in any archive at all, whether in China or elsewhere. So, so that, that ability to access the archives is it. But on the other hand, I should also say that it really isn't all that much of a challenge. Um, these archives were relatively open um, after the turn of the millennium from the year 2000 onwards, um, if not for the period before 1949, then gradually also for the period uh, post-49. Uh, In other words, the, the, the decades under Mao and the Communist Revolution. Um, so I guess the real puzzle is why it is that when one has access to an archive in, let's say, you know, Lanzhou or Guangzhou or Beijing or, or elsewhere, municipal, provincial archive, why is it that one finds local historians uh, doing interesting work, but so very few foreigners? That, that to me, is the, the key sort of bemusement, if, if you wish. Okay, that's a very good point. And I think, you know, uh, this brings up to the whole issue of the relationship between political culture and uh, objective academic research. Uh, if you're a Chinese citizen, if you're a dedicated historian in pursuit of truth, and you have access to archives, and you find out the truth, yet the political culture in China is such that it, it will be almost impossible for you to become an authority of that particular subject matter because you cannot publish that, uh, because you will be persecuted, uh, and you, your access to archive will be cut off if you dare to talk about some of the sensitive issues the party would not want you to talk about, yet truthful facts, truthful narratives. I'm also told, precisely because of that reason, if you are not within the sovereign control of Chinese government, say if you're a foreigner, you say, for example, somebody like you, 
who is a foreigner who is really dedicated to study Chinese history, you have enormous advantages right there because you you can not only access the archives, you can also publish anywhere you want. And so the reason why your question is so poignant is because why is that so few scholars like yourself who would be brave enough to venture into kind of a uh, truth-seeking journeys, right? My reading is that uh, because China also control access to some of the uh, Chinese academic resources. So many scholars were afraid that their contact with their colleagues in China, access to Chinese sponsored conference will be cut off. So can you sp uh, spare some moments talk about that aspect of that? In what way you have advantages, in what way you also have to really be brave enough to really break the pattern of academic cowardice overall? Well, I'm not brave at all. If anything, I'm, I'm pretty much a, a coward. <laughs> I'm happy to say that publicly. The, the truly brave people are, again, some of the very good historians in the PRC. You know, one example at random, uh, Chiao Peihua, a wonderful historian who consulted the archives of, um, I believe it is Henan province, to find out what happened during the famine from 58 to 62. Horrendous, millions of people died. She got hold of the best quality material you could think of. She's about to publish a book 1988, 1989 appears, 200 tanks enter Beijing, crush the local population. Who, her book is put on ice. She has to wait for something like 10, 15, 20 years. Finally, she publishes it. It's a wonderful book, and she continues to do good research. So what we should not underestimate is the extraordinary resilience of many of these scholars in the PRC, uh, who frequently are party members themselves, and still... Uh, are concerned about the quality of the evidence and speaking truth about the past. And you encounter them all the time. So then the question really is, um, what does it take for a foreigner to do the same thing? I'd say not very much. After all, <laughs> we do when we live in Europe or the United States or Japan or elsewhere. We do, do live in democratic institutions. It shouldn't take that much to get on a plane and have a letter of reference and try to find out something in an archive here or there. There are thousands of them in the People's Republic of China. So I guess it goes back to an issue um, related to the very um, history of the field itself. After 1949, uh, the boundary came, the borders uh, clearly were closed in the People's Republic of China. And any foreigner with an interest in research in China, whether it was an economist or a political scientist or a historian, even if you're a historian of the Song or the Ming or the Tang or any dynasty, you cannot go there. You cannot do your research. And this goes on for decades with some opening up after the death of Mao in the 1980s. Then, of course, 1989. Nine, Tiananmen Square and the massacre that took place, the doors closed again for a number of years. So it, it is a very relative opening up and closing down all the time. Right now, as, as you can imagine, with COVID, it's been closed for, for two years uh, for pretty much uh, rigorously. So the, the point really is that it is a field that has developed uh, in the absence of regular contact with primary sources, this field that has become used to doing something I refer to as armchair sinology. And armchair sinology is something that you do in your office sitting in your armchair. Okay, that's a very good uh, uh, response. I think uh, we both know a historian, amateur historian based uh, in London, who uh, uh, was asked to write a, a relatively sort of small project on Mao uh, as a biographer. So when she ventured into China, uh, her original plan was not really ambitious, but then when she went to China, many people who knew about Mao, who had access to the archives related to Mao's uh, atrocities and his, um, her, his ambitions, and all his deeds, behaviors, personal uh, contacts, who could not publish otherwise, and came to her, gave her a lot of information, and urged her to write, say, you're a British citizen, and you can basically write uh, uh, a biography and get published uh, and become famous that we could never be. Right. So I think, you know, uh, to take your point, you said there are some very brave Chinese authors who basically uh, publish amazing stuff. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the point is that they could not publish the great books and be rewarded by the society, gain awards uh, like you. You publish a great book and, and the world recognizes it. The moment any good work is recognized in China, the government bans it. 
uh, just like the films or all the other other things over there, because precisely because the, their impact could be potentially very big, and that's basically you know it's going to be very important. Now let me just uh, um, shift to another uh, direction slightly. You have done phenomenal work documenting the history of the PRC. Um, I could not find a better person um, uh, than you to basically uh, tell us the main thrust of the PRC. If you have, say, three main themes of PRC history, and what would they be? I know this is a very general, very broad, but uh, for the audience uh, listening to this program, I think will be tremendously helpful for them. That's incredibly difficult to, 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 to do, to come up with, you know, three sort of main themes. But I think one of the issues when we talk about communist China, in other words, uh, the People's Republic of China after 1949 under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, that's what I mean by communist China, uh, that we tend to think, uh, not just in Europe but also in the United States, as it not being quite communist, really. I think that's that's one of the problems when it comes to interpreting uh, whatever material one finds on this era. Um, and this starts even before 1949, when the State Department of the United States of America portrays Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao later, and the communists as, as really agrarian reformers and not communists. When decades later, Kissinger and Nixon go in there and again portray this as some sort of Confucian civilization, which has been around for millennia, as opposed to to, of course, a communist society, which it is. And time and again, whether they are Republican or whether they are Democrats, American presidents, who seem to think that somehow this society has absolutely nothing to do with communism. Because when you read the sources, um, there's crystal clear that people are not exactly shy about proclaiming their pride in being communist and being pretty determined to build up a communist society. Um, this is pretty evident right away from uh, the word go, 1949, referred to by the regime as a liberation, whereas in fact it is very much um, followed by um, an attempt to uh, bring everybody in that society um, under the control of the party, the systematic crushing of civil society. In other words, an attempt to make sure that no... Uh, organization can exist outside of the organization of the party. Now, of course, this is not exactly something new. We have seen it under uh, Hitler and Nazi Germany. We've seen it under the, the Soviet Union with uh, Stalin. It, it's a common feature of dictatorships that you simply cannot tolerate any platform, any organization, any individual who might have an independent voice. So that, that characterizes China after 49. Um, now, it goes on, of course. Uh, in particular, I think a key moment is this attempt to build up a thoroughly collectivized society with the Great Leap Forward in 1958, when hundreds of millions of people in the countryside are herded into giant, massive collectives called people's communes, where everything is shared, uh, tools, pots, uh, land, tasks, all are really very much distributed by the, the, the party officials in charge, and ordinary people are reduced to the status of bonded servants. A uh, party official will tell you what work you will do and when you will do it, and you get work points for it. The result is a catastrophe with tens of millions of people starved to death, as had happened, of course, during collectivization under Stalin many decades earlier, and as will happen in North Korea later on. So these regimes tend to replicate what they do. So that, to me, is also an absolute key turning point. And then something else happens, which I think is a characteristic that comes out of this whole thing and is with us to, to, to this very day, namely that people in the countryside are so um, fed up with collectivization that already before the death of Chairman Mao, he dies in 1976, they start taking back the land. 
they claim back tools. They start undermining the people's collectives. They open underground factories. They basically go back to society as it was before 1949, where individual enterprise actually matters. They hollow out the collectivized economy, which collapses in 1982 in the countryside. From there onwards, what you see is very much an attempt by the regime to, on the one hand, allow ordinary people to have basic economic freedoms, but on the other hand, suppress any um, desire they might have to acquire political freedoms. So this sort of schizophrenic approach, which we find sometimes as foreigners difficult to understand. You know, the, 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 the certain economic freedoms that are combined with the absence of political freedoms. And this is best, I think, um, illustrated by the 200 tanks and 100,000 soldiers who enter Beijing on Tiananmen Square in June 1989. That very massacre sends out a very powerful message that resonates till this very day. Never question the monopoly of the power of the Communist Party. That's great. You just published a book uh, following your, uh, I would say, two really uh, incredible projects. One is a, a book about the famine. Uh, secondly, it's a trilogy of the uh, history of the uh, People's Republic of China. The recent one is uh, um, a, about the rise of China after Mao. Let's just say uh, the... Uh, Famine book is about the particular top subject. Let's talk about general history. What will be the sort of throughout the, uh, the, the, the chronology of the history from 1949 to 2022? Any changes at all? Well, of, of course, but you have to bear in mind, I mean, 49 or 22 is a, is a long bit of history. Um, so I know where you're going with your question, and you're absolutely right. But you've got to remember, again, comparison helps. Um, the Soviet Union uh, under Stalin is not the same as the Soviet Union under Khrushchev, which is not the same as the Soviet Union under Brezhnev. These regimes are not frozen in time. They, they change. But what it does not change is the determination on the part of the leadership to, on the one hand, maintain a monopoly over power, which is a very basic Leninist principle that you must have a monopoly over power in order to, to carry out the revolution from above. And on the other hand, uh, ownership over the means of production. Now, the means of production is basically anything that goes into your production process. So this could be raw materials, could be the land, could be labor, could be capital, could be energy. These must be controlled by uh, the state. That's a classic, if you wish, Marxist uh, economy. Now, you might say, surely things have changed enormously from the death of Mao in 1976 to, to this day. We had people's communes and state enterprises uh, at every level. Every person in China by 76 was more or less a state employee, even if you run a very small shop. Um, surely things are utterly different today. I would say, no, not really. <laughs> not really. It's uh, embrace of the world, and in particular the WTO, have enabled the party not so much to weaken its control of the economy, but to strengthen it. Uh, to this very day, the means of production do belong to the state. It is the banks which belong to the state which allocate capital. It is not the market. The land belongs to the state. Uh, labor is poorly paid and, of course, not able to have any unions with strikes being outlawed. Uh, raw materials are very much distributed, as is energy, by, by the state. So the result is that with the WTO, state enterprises are incredibly powerful with the result that not even a country like Bangladesh is actually able to compete so that, that is the, the result here. So a complete change in which the economy uh, and the relationship to the rest of the world is envisaged, uh, yet uh, very much the opposite consequence of what some foreigners thought might happen with the WTO. The idea was WTO, China will embrace a rules-based order, will reform its state enterprises, the private sector will thrive. Turns out it's the other way around. That's a very, very uh, good uh, uh, description of what's going on about the continuities and changes uh, in the PRC. You know, the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party really cares about uh, how history is written. And uh, they absolutely uh, are serious about making sure 
that uh, history can only be written by itself. Uh, nobody else can write it. One of the very important uh, historical lessons that keep sort of indoctrinated indoctrinated the nation with is the point that uh, yes, the party has done some terrible things bad in the past, right? Because of personal flaws of Mao, and uh, that's what they say. Uh, uh, by ignoring the systemic reasons for these uh, pogroms, uh, causing tens of millions of people's lives in China in peacetime, by the way. Uh, on the other hand, they keep telling people, hey, listen, without the Communist Party, China will get into chaos and uh, render this country ungovernable. Now, you mentioned something very interesting earlier in your remarks that you talk about the incredible resiliency of the Chinese people. The, uh, the bravery of people, either in scholarly fields or in economic production fields, right? You talk about the peasants breaking away from the uh, collective model of people's communes. Right? Could you say a little bit more about the resiliency of the Chinese people in the period of history you have been studying? Well, I, I think that that's precisely it. I think you put your finger on it uh, much better than I could do. Is that what is so astounding when you read about how this party organizers from 49 onwards, um, the repression of ordinary people, including scholars. Um, you know, whether it is in the 1950s when the methods used were, were, were much more brutal, or, or whether it is uh, after the turn of the millennium, uh, when clearly you will not be sent to a labor camp, um, but nonetheless, somebody might appear in your office uh, or in your village and threaten you with uh, detention. But what is so impressive is that despite all of that, there are so many stubborn people. <laughs> and there are so many extraordinarily resilient people who are just determined to do uh, things the way they think it should be done. So what you then discover is not so much this image we have of a dictatorship, uh, where orders are followed from top to bottom of a very ordered and stable society. There's rather a party constantly trying to, to, to keep hold of, of moving on quicksand, really, quicksand, constantly. I, I noticed earlier on that the people's communes collapsed in 1982 as a result of them being hollowed out by ordinary villagers who take back the land, take back their own resources, take back their tools, and... and, and, and undermine it from, from below. But it goes much further than that. One of the key characteristics, surely from the 1980s onwards, is that enormous tension between the central government and local governments, where local governments will protect their own resources very jealously. We think frequently, uh, for instance, in terms of a domestic market. You know, you get stuff from Manchester to Lancaster, or you ship stuff from New York to LA. It's not a big deal. But in the People's Republic, what you have really is not so much a united economy, but a, a, a loose patchwork of, of independent fiefdoms where local governments are keen to protect their own resources uh, by erecting all sorts of, uh, of, of invisible checkpoints and, 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 and borders. Uh, so it is not at all an image of an ordered society, but one which is being constantly subverted by people at every level, whether these are local governments, whether these are party members, whether these are ordinary people, or whether these are scholars. There's this constant attempt to... to to bend rules, to somehow ignore them, to, to bypass a central directive, to somehow do what one thinks is, is best. So not so, much, uh, not so much order, but that, anarchy. I agree with completely. You know, uh, I'm about to offer a course at the Naval Academy. It's uh, basically history of PRC. So the department asked me uh, to uh, provide the picture image that will capture the essence of the course. I thought uh, a long while, and I, I finally put up the picture of the long man standing in front of the tanks in Tiananmen Square. Uh, and the reason I put it up there is precisely what you said. That image is not an aberration. It's, it's not about the bravery of one individual. It represented the bravery and resilience of the entire population even though their resilience and their bravery may not be that open or overt, but nevertheless, resilience is still there. So, um, and it, I, I think the power of the resilience and resistance, oblique descent, is a very subterranean and very powerful. And that is the irony of history. The uh, Communist Party looks very strong, and their uh, mechanism of repression is 
unspeakably brutal and powerful, enabled and empowered by modern technology, surveillance, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, you name it. How you deposit your ba- uh, money into the bank, how you cross the, the, the roads, how you drive, and how you check in the hotel. Everything is monitored. Despite all that, the dissent, the resilience have always been there. So that's why um, I always uh, keep telling myself, I think there's the future of China and it's going to be very, very bright precisely because of that. Uh, so it's not really a Tiananmen, uh, Tiananmen uh, uh, maybe a crackdown, uh, but the spirit lingers on and it's going to be there. Uh, it's going to revive someday. I think we are uh, pretty close to the ending uh, of our uh, broadcast, but uh, I'd like to ask you one final question. After your three major projects, what's your future research plan? Uh, go back in time. Go back in time and study uh, the period before 1949. How do you get a very simple question, but the answer is not so straightforward. How do you get from 12 people in a room in Shanghai in 1921, as the Communist Party of China is founded, established, how do you get from there to the red flag going up over the Forbidden City in Beijing in 1949, that process of conquest? How, how, how did that happen? The Chinese government is, uh, is telling us right now the reason why the Chinese Communist Party rose to power in 1949 is because of choices of history and the people. How do you respond to that? Um, I'll let you know, but I doubt it very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. DeCotter, and uh, this has been very fascinating, and uh, we are very honored to have you, and uh, wish your future uh, research endeavor great success. Thank you. This has been a production of the History Department at the U.S. Naval Academy located in Annapolis, Maryland. If you enjoy our programs, please let us know as we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at USNA History, and our email is historyproductions-group at usna.edu. For more information about the History Department at the Naval Academy, please visit usna.edu history.